the heart of God. My mind is anchored in the truth. My mind is anchored in the truth. I'm living free in the heart of My name is Reverend Doug Wirth, and I want to welcome you today to Unity of Chattanooga Sunday Celebration Service at the beach. In this day and age, it, it seems that we are spiritual beings having a digital experience, and it's good to imagine your smiling faces and feeling your open hearts. Thank you for making us your weekly destination for an inspiring message and meditation. And thank you to the music team at Unity of the Oaks in California for opening our services today. They always do such an awesome job. Please feel free to add comments below so that we know that you're here. When we interact with each other, it's a great way to create that feeling of community, even though we're virtual. And if you know of others who would find value in our message, you can also share this morning's service with them. Unity of Chattanooga is part of Unity World Mind Ministries with core values of diversity, inclusivity, and equality. Unity founders Charles and Myrtle Fillmore believe that by accepting each other, we expand our spiritual consciousness. And today, more than 100 years later, Unity is still dedicated to helping all people discover a positive path of spiritual living because we teach that all people are created with sacred worth, and no one exists outside the heart of God. In the month of June, we celebrate Pride Month with the LBGTQ community. The entire month is dedicated to the uplifting of their voices and the support of their rights. We're all familiar with the rainbow pride flag that is used as a symbol of their community, but did you know that each color of the flag has its own meaning? Red is symbolic of life. Orange is symbolic of healing. Yellow is sunlight. Green is nature. Blue represents harmony and purple is spirit. 
You know, it seems to me that these are the necessary fundamentals for any life well lived with authenticity. Our affirmation for this month is, I am open to a deeper understanding of spirit within all people, for we are one. So let's take a few moments now and join together in prayer. And so as we become quiet and we still our mind, we go within to that sacred space where God is and always has been. And as we say yes to the flow of spirit within us, we say yes to the flow of spirit in all of us, bringing that divinity and respect for each other into expression right here and right now. So together we bless today's service and all those with helping hands who have helped put it together. We give thanks for all those gathered online with us here today and for the growth and expansion that we know will be taking place in our lives today. We affirm that today is a magnificent day, a day that the Lord has made and we will rejoice in it and be glad. And so we say and affirm, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. And so it is. Amen. Our guest speaker this morning is Reverend Sandra Campbell, representing or presenting her talk called Divine Imperfection. Reverend Sandra currently serves as the Associate Minister at Unity Temple on the Plaza in Kansas City. She is also the Executive Director of the Unity Urban Ministerial School, and is a member of the Board of Directors at Unity Worldwide Headquarters. She is a true powerhouse, and we thank her for being with us today. But before we hear from Reverend Sanda, we get to enjoy another song from our good friends at Unity of the Oaks in California. <laughs> When you can't find your direction And your heart won't guide you home Let go Let God When your dreams are broken in the dust And you've lost the will to trust Let go Let God Let the signs remind you The signs remind you to surrender, to surrender. Let go, let go, and let God, let God. When faith's a dying fire. There's no spark to feed the flame. Let go and let God. When your courage fails you and the well of hope runs dry, let go and let God. Let the signs remind.
Good morning, Unity of Chattanooga. I am so happy to be joining you again. Thank you to Pennyworth and Faye Ann Schmidt for inviting me. I'm excited about this opportunity to share with you what I think is an important lesson for all of us, especially for me. Whenever I speak, I'm reading my own mail. So I'm not exempt and I'm not a guru and I've not perfected it. I'm reading my own mail. I wanna also thank Doug Worth uh, for his platform assistance today. I know he's doing a great job. And the amazing music team from Unity of the Oaks in Thousand Oaks, California for their outstanding talent. And Shannon Lebrun, our sound, your sound uh, man, our sound technician for the great job that he's doing. I miss you, Reverend Fayan, and I pray that you're having a great day off. I hope that something that I say will enlighten you, brighten your spirits and encourage you. I like to be, begin with my special prayer. Lord, fill my mouth with worthwhile stuff and nudge me when I've said enough. Behind me is a setting that doesn't look quite appropriate for Unity of Chattanooga's service. It's kind of busy. We like for our videos, our Zooms to be feng shui, have very little in the background so it's not a distraction. So this is really imperfect for today, but perfect for the lesson on divine imperfection. So I'm going to give you a little history lesson. Earlier this week, this was set up in my living room. There's more to it. There's a lot more. As the stage for my one-woman show, Follow Your Dreams, The Bessie Coleman Story. 100 years ago, on June 15, 1921, Bessie Coleman earned her pilot's license from the International uh, Pilot School of the Caldron Brothers, L'Ecole d'Aviation des Frères Caudron. Bessie Coleman's life was less than perfect. She grew up in a small town in Texas, Waxahachie. She had very little education. She didn't have an opportunity to go to college. She moved to Chicago and she got a job after going through cosmetology school as a manicurist in a barber shop. She'd heard about flying because World War I had started, but black people, black men had signed up in hopes of becoming flyers during World War I and they were turned down and given opportunities to be foot soldiers. So her brothers enlisted in the all-colored 8th Infantry of the Illinois National Guard and were stationed in France during World War I. She learned about flying that French women were already doing and she so wanted to become a pilot. But all the doors in this country were closed because she was a black woman. She saved enough money, got some benefactors and made her way to Paris where she trained for nine months to fly in French. She had gone to a night school. She didn't learn French and she didn't speak perfect French, but she understood it and spoke it well enough to make it through that flight training and become not only the first African-American female of record to obtain a pilot's license, but most likely the first American to attain an international pilot's license. So I'm very proud to represent the wonderful, the amazing Queen Bess, Bessie Coleman. A little bit of history and a little bit about divine imperfection. So let me start with just something a little funny. A little boy was at the grocery store with his mother and he begged for a box of animal crackers, which she bought. When he got home and they were putting the groceries away, he opened the box of animal crackers and lined them all up on the counter and started turning them over one by one. The mother asked, what was he doing? And he said, well, I'm looking for the seal. She said, the seal? He said, yes, it says on the box, if the seal is broken, do not eat it. <laughs> now take that slowly, because it may be a slow one, but you get what I mean. So I want to talk about divine imperfection. You know, when I think about divine imperfection, I think about the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul said in the book of Philippians, the third chapter, the 12th through the 13th verses, not that I have already obtained all of this, or have already been made perfect. I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, I press on toward the goal of my highest calling in Christ Jesus. What is Paul saying? Paul said, I'm not perfect, 
but I'm following the divinity in me and I'm divinely imperfect. Unity's second principle is that we are made in the image and likeness of God and therefore we inherit goodness. We are inherently good. Even if we don't behave in good ways all the time, we are divinely imperfect, divinely imperfect. And so when, when I think about divine imperfection, I think about what young Pueblo said. I am not fully healed. I am not fully wise. I, I am still on my way. What matters is that I am moving forward. He was basically saying what Paul said. I'm not yet made perfect, but I press forward toward my goal. Now, some people are perfectionists. They go to great lengths and punishing routines to be the best and the first at everything. They want to be, have the perfect figure. They want to make the perfect score. They want to have the perfect grades and have the perfect performance. Some people literally drive themselves insane trying to strive toward perfection which is not ours to do. But there are certain cultures that do not embrace this concept, this American concept particularly, of perfection, survival of the fittest, and so forth. They embrace the concept of imperfection. Artists and craftspersons from these cultures, diff they deliberately introduce flaws into their works so that they can show an illustration of their own humanness, that God is perfect, but we are not. So as an example, the Navajo rug weavers put little imperfections into their rugs on the borders. And they call this line of imperfection shihanti ai, which is translated in English as spirit line or spirit pathway. They believe that when weaving a rug, the weaver entwines part of their own being into the cloth. The spirit line allows this trapped part of the weaver's spirit to safely exit the rug. The Navajos also believe that God is perfect and that humans cannot achieve the same perfect level. So they make sure to leave little imperfection in anything they create. The same is true for wabasabi, which is a 16th century Japanese art it's that deliberately puts imperfections into their art. The characteristics of wabi-sabi are symmetric, symmet, sym, excuse me, asymmetry, roughness, simplicity, and appreciation of the ingenuous integrity of natural objects and processes. The wabi-sabi aesthetic can be seen in styles of pottery, tea bowls, that are often chipped or nicked, or architecture where the roof is slightly askew. And also the Buddhist monk's robes called kisa, which are draped diagonally across the body with a small patchwork construction as a reminder of the humble patch that Buddha wore in his garment. So how do these examples relate to divine imperfection? Well, these concepts reinforce the idea that there is beauty in imperfection. And beauty itself is imperfect, impermanent, and incomplete. I have a personal example. When I was growing up, I had a very wide gap between my two front teeth. And I was very embarrassed about it. I was teased a lot. I would be walking home from school and someone would say, hey, they can drive a truck through your teeth. And my parents didn't think it was enough of a deal to do anything about it. So, I had to live with it and deal with it. And inside of me, I never felt like I was attractive. I was never pretty enough, you know? So I developed a complex. I made up my mind that when I got a good job, I was going to have that fixed. I was going to go to a dentist and have my gap closed. My dentist, Dr. Tom Jones, was a family friend who had been to, went to high school with my brother and sister who were quite a bit older than me. So at 21, I approached Dr. Jones and said, I want you to close my gap. Dr. Jones says, why? And I said, because it's embarrassing and I don't, wanna, I don't want it anymore. I want my teeth to be closed like my brother and sister. They have perfect looking teeth. To this day, I'm always looking at people's teeth and attracted by very nicely, you know, rounded and, and closed teeth. I mean, just, I'm fascinated by beautiful teeth. 
And so Dr. Jones gave me a lecture. He said, Sandra, you are beautiful, just as you are. Of course, I didn't believe him. He said, why would you want to change the way God made you? That gap is a symbol of beauty. Nobody I knew had this gap. And so I thought, well, it's not beautiful to me, and other people think I look ridiculous. He said, well, I want you to go home and take a week and just think about what I said. Well, Dr. Jones' words didn't work. And when I returned two weeks later, I insisted that he close my gap. Dr. Jones said to me, Sandra, one day, you're going to come to you realize that you are beautiful just the way you are, and you really are. It wasn't until my early 30s that I really understood Dr. Jones' message. I'd been in unity quite a few years and learning about the divinity in me, that I am made in the image and likeness of God, therefore everything about me is perfect. And so I went back to Dr. Jones and I said, I want you to bring back my gap. Well, of course, he had, he had sawed down two perfectly good teeth to create the bridge, the cap, over my teeth. So now he had to create a smaller, two smaller teeth so that the gap would show. You know, that taught me a powerful lesson. In the years since, I learned that there's a tribe in Africa where that gap is traditional. It's a symbol of beauty. And then not long after that, after Dr. Jones put my gap back or, you know, white, made the teeth smaller so my gap would show, I noticed there were more people on TV with gaps. And I began to see that having a gap in your teeth is not ugly, that it's beautiful. It's a divine imperfection. My son years later used to tease about how when I would get upset with him and my sister, him and my daughter, and I would be fussing at them, how my cheeks would go in and out showing my dimples and they would, and they would just be fascinated by this, these little holes that go in and out. My son is the only one who has a dimple and he has one. My dad had two deep dimples. And so he said to me, he did some research and he said, you know, that's a birth defect, that dimples are a birth defect. But how many people admire someone with beautiful dimples? Now mine is not as pronounced as some people, but when I see someone with dimples, it's, they're just cute. And, and so that's a divine imperfection. It just brings out more of the divinity in us when we see these little things that we think are imperfect, but they're divinely perfect. As, spirit, as scripture says, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And that means all of us, no matter what we think is imperfect, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And so Jesus said to the disciples in the book of Matthew, the seventh chapter, the third verse, something similar when he said, and why worry about the speck in your friend's eye and you don't see the log in your own? What is Jesus saying to the disciples? He's saying, why are you so concerned about other people's imperfections when you have imperfections of your own? And those imperfections are divine and you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are divinity, you are God in expression. It took a lot of years for me to grow into maturity to realize that just as I am, I am divinely imperfect and I am God in expression. So I thought about this on Father's Day I was thinking about how many of my friends had these who I thought were perfect fathers. You know, like we saw on TV, Father's, Father Knows Best and Leave It to Beaver and Donna Reed. And they didn't even look like my father at all. But I thought, wow, it would be nice to have a dad like that. My dad was an alcoholic. He served in World War II, probably had PTSD. He worked hard, but he didn't do all the things that I thought perfect fathers did. We didn't go to a father-daughter dance. I got married at the courthouse. He didn't give me away, he didn't come, I didn't have a wedding. You know, he didn't do a lot of the things that fathers should do, but there were things that he did do in his divinity and his imperfection. He taught me an excellent work ethic. That ne man never missed a day of work. He'd say he'd go to work drunk if he had to. And he was very respected because of his work ethic. And so he taught me that, and I worked for 42 years for the federal government because my dad instilled in me that you go to work every day and you do a good job. And, you, and then you retire when it's time, and you'll feel good about it. My dad didn't, he was killed before his retirement, but he had worked a long time, and he had, he had taught some good lessons. Another lesson he taught me that I remember as a child, and I've put in perspective as an adult, is fishing. Now, I looked up some of the fishing places in the Chattanooga area, and you all have some wonderful fishing holes, and I bet you have some great fishermen and fisherwomen. 
I was never one of them. Couldn't stand fishing. Well, you stand there for hours, or dad would, with a pole and a, and a line and wait for the fish to jump on the hook. And I'm like, this is boring. But was it, what wasn't boring was spending that quality time with daddy. And this was the interesting thing. I saw a different part of my dad, sort of a meditative state as he stood there in complete silence, just listening to the, the, the water and watching as the fish jumped in and out and waiting for that fish to bite. He taught me, you know, he would bait my hook, so he didn't have to teach me much because I wasn't touching a worm and I wasn't gonna touch a slimy fish. He just wanted the company, thank God. So he would bait my hook and then he'd slowly guide my hand so that I would lower my line into the water. And he told me when the little red thing went up and down, I was probably, if it went out down a lot, I was probably getting a fish on that hook. Lo and behold, I would scream when I saw it. And he'd say, stop, you're gonna scare the fish. And then he'd come over, he'd sometimes lose his pole trying to help me, and he'd pull my pole slowly up and the line slowly up, and then he'd take this little tiny fish off the hook. It was so little, it looked like a minnow. And he'd throw it back in the water. And I would cry and say, Daddy, why'd you do that? I wanted to show Mama that I caught a fish. He'd say, Honey, that fish is too small. That's a baby. You need to wait until you can get a bigger fish. The connection I've made to that divine imperfection experience is that the little fish represent small thinking. In fact, Charles Fillmore, Unity's co-founder, in the definition of fish in the revealing word says, fish represent the multiplicity of ideas. So what my father was teaching me was when you get, when you have small thinking and small ideas, release that, let that go and get a bigger catch. Something that represents the, the multitude, the magnificence of you, a bigger thought, a bigger idea, catch and release. You know, catch, what, catch, catch the small ideas and let them go, catch the big ideas and hold on to them and grow. So I learned those powerful lessons from my father who was less than perfect divinely imperfect, as we all are. Bart Millard, one of the founders of the group Mercy Me, had a terrible childhood. You may have seen the movie about his life called I Can Only Imagine. His father was as mean as a junkyard dog. And when Bart Millard was little, he, he had a powerful imagination. He would go from, to, from place to place in that small town, and they would always know Bart was coming. They'd have cardboard and other discarded things for him to take home, and he would build spaceships, and he would build all kinds of things, helmets, and, and his father would come home from work, and I'd maybe drunk, and he would see this, and he hated that Bart had this vivid imagination, and, and he, he hated to see Bart playing about things that he told him would never happen. So he would scarf up all of Bart's imaginary toys that he had created and he'd take them to the trash barrel and burn them and tell, them, tell him he'd never amount to anything. Bart grew up to hate his father, but toward the end of his father's life, he recognized the divinity, the divine imperfection in his dad. And recognizing that divinity inspired the song, I Can Only Imagine. Isn't it amazing how something bad can turn into something so good? Like Joseph and his brothers in the book of Genesis, when they finally meet up with him after they had done so many horrendous things and thought they had in, gotten him out of the, their lives out of jealousy. He went through so much, being jailed, being a slave, and finally he had, he had just demonstrated his own innate abilities. He continued to let his light shine despite his terrible circumstances. And that resulted in him being a governor over Egypt and saving his family from famine. And when they recognized who he was, they were afraid. They thought he was going to do, for them, do to them what they did to him. And he said to them, my God, you intended it for bad, but my God intended it for good. What was imperfect in his life, his own brothers selling him into slavery, giving him up for dead, turned out to be perfect, divinely imperfect, divine imperfection. The late great Leonard Cohen wrote the song that I dearly love. And you probably have heard these words from this song. Ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. What is that about divine imperfection? There is imperfection in everything, but it's all divine. That's how the light gets in. It, there, there's imperfection in us but that's how the light gets in. So when I think about 
this idea of divine imperfection, what I want you to remember most is that being a perfectionist is not to our advantage, but acknowledging our imperfections and then using those imperfections to our advantages, to our advantage, is what life, abundant life is all about. Yeah, that gap between my teeth, it was not the greatest thing, it was imperfect. To me, perfect teeth, you don't have any spaces and they're all white, pearly white, and, and they're all even and there's no overbite or underbite. But you know what? If you have an overbite, an underbite, a gap, or missing teeth, you're divinely imperfect, just as you are. As I was working on this talk today, I have a divinely imperfect office downstairs. You know, they say, you know, when you have a, a neat desk, it's a sign of a, a busy mind. Well, my mind is really busy. The whole office is in disarray. And I, sometimes I can't find anything. And I decided one day, I'm just going to start taking all the books that are not put on the shelf right and set those aside so I can organize things better. And as I was doing it, a book that I'd forgotten I had while I'm working on this talk just popped out all of a sudden. Divine imperfection. And it's called The Straight Jacket of Perfectionism. How about that? How to Stop Chasing Perfect and Finally Achieve Your Greatest Goals. How to Stop Chasing Perfect and Finally Achieve Your Greatest Goals. It's written by a Unity minister, and his name is John Connor. And in his final thoughts in the book, he says, remember that being less than perfect means being fully human. People love their friends and families for their personalities, thoughtfulness, and even their quirks, not for their achievements. Look around you. Have you become so obsessed with being perfect in one aspect of your life that you've neglected other aspects? Always remember, change is possible, especially for imperfect beings like ourselves. With a bit of reflection and effort, we can move toward greater achievements. We can be creative, productive people which is far better and far more interesting than being perfect people. Had Bessie Coleman been perfect, she might not have ever gone through all the hoops that she went through to end up getting to France so that she could learn to fly. Divine imperfection, that's how we survive. So I invite you now to think about this deeply. What flaws or imperfections do you see in yourself? Let's not think about the speck in our friend's eyes. Let's look at the log in our own. How do you see yourself? What is it about yourself that you wish you could change, that you absolutely don't like? Maybe it's the shape of your body. Maybe it's the color, you know, what's something you can change the color of your hair. If I wanted to, I could change the gray. But maybe it's the shape of your nose. Your ears are too big or too small. Your lips are too big or too small. Maybe your hands. Whatever it is about yourself, just remember you are made in the image and likeness of God. And guess what? You are divinely imperfect. And that's a good place to be. So as we close, I want to remind you of the daily word that says, let go and let God. Let go of ideas of lack and limitation, of imperfection, and know that you are wonderfully and fearfully made in the image and likeness of God, divinely imperfect. And as you do, remember the words of this song by Ricky Byers. I release and I let go. I let spirit run my life. And I'm free in the spirit Cause I'm only here for God. No more struggles, no more strife. With my faith I see the light. I am free in the spirit and I'm only here for God. I am free in the spirit and I'm only here for God. There's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. Namaste. I invite you now to find that comfortable position in your seats or wherever you are. Take a deep breath. Inhale slowly to the count of three and then hold it for a brief second. 
and exhale slowly to the count of four. Inhale and exhale. Breathing in, breathing out. We have marked this time to shift our attention from our plans and concerns to the center of being in which we know spirit is all, everywhere, and the essence of everything. In this reality, we concentrate our attention so that we know spirit is at the center of our being and we are one as we enter into this time of prayer. I invite you as you continue to monitor your breathing, focusing your attention on every breath, inhaling and out and exhaling. And when you feel distracted by thoughts or outer noises, just breathe into that moment. Take these words as your own. I am peace at the core of my being. I am one with the spirit of peace. Breath by breath, I settle in to a peace that instills calm, confidence, and courage. Even in my feelings of imperfection, I know that I am divine. Take a deep breath and slowly exhale. And follow the rise and fall of every breath. Take these words as your own. I listen to inner wisdom and I am guided to live my purpose. Within my mind and heart, intuition flows as a steady stream, an ever ready sense of direction. Wisdom is natural to me, for I am one with the spirit of wisdom. I choose wisely, purposely, prayerfully, and I am attentive in the silence. Take a deep breath. Feel yourself relaxing more and more and attentive to the present moment. Release any thought that lessens your well-being, your feeling of wholeness. Acknowledge that any imperfections are divine, for you are divine. Take these words as your own. I live in the flow of healing, renewing vitality. Well-being is my experience as I know the truth of my divine life. Take another deep breath and slowly relax as you exhale. Take these words as your own. My thoughts, words, and actions create a space for peace and love. I hold the world and all beings in the light of peace and love. Guarding my thoughts, I choose compassion. Measuring my words, I choose encouragement. Preparing my actions, I choose kindness. I am one with the spirit of peace and love, always and in this moment of prayer.
Take a deep, relaxing, affirming breath. Hold it for a brief second. And then as you release it, remind yourself that you are human and divine. Divinely imperfect. And as we complete this period of prayer, anticipating the hours ahead, we set our intentions to remain centered in abundant peace, wisdom, and life. One with God, our source, we embody these divine qualities by which we experience and express the light of the world. And we close this sacred time with the prayer for protection and the I am statements. The light of God surrounds us. I am light. The love of God enfolds us. I am love. The power of God protects us. I am power. The presence of God watches over us. I am presence. Wherever we are, God is. I am divine. And so it is, and so it will be. Thank you, God. And we all say, Amen. Namaste. Thank you, Reverend Sanda, for your message and meditation this morning, reminding us to trust that the activity of God is always guiding and directing us. Now is the time in our service to celebrate our prosperity and acknowledge that God is the source of all good, flowing to us, through us, and as us. Charles Fillmore used to say that the more we rely on spirit, the greater the supply will be in our lives. Not only is this a chance to give, but a chance for you to feel God's gift flowing through you and understand who our source really is. As you think of the gift you'd like to give this morning, give this gift in love and remember that you are really giving back to God. And so now let us take a moment and bless these gifts with our offertory affirmation. Divine love through me, blesses and multiplies all that I am, all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. I give in love and I receive in abundance. As we bless these gifts, we send them forth to fulfill the vision and the mission of Unity of Chattanooga. And so please join us now in singing our love offering song.
For our announcements this morning, mark your calendars and save the date for our first in-person Sunday celebration service this year. Sunday, July 18th at the Tennessee River Park in Pavilion No. 1. Inspirational speaker and award-winning songwriter Sean O'Shea will be joining us as our guest speaker and musician. Again, that's July 18th, 11 a.m. at the Tennessee River Park. We also have a new, a new Zoom gathering on Sunday afternoons following the Sunday service. So today at 1215, that will be hosted by the board and it's called, Let's Talk About It. It's a time to get together, talk about the Sunday message or whatever else might be on your mind. So I hope you'll check it out. We also offer our Sunday morning meditation at 930 on Zoom. To get information in our bi-monthly newsletter, send your email address to contact at unityofchattanooga.org. There is a Zoom workshop that's being hosted by Unity of Raleigh called Empowering Affirmative Prayer. And that's on Thursday evening, July 1st from 7 to 8.30. Presented by the Vice President of Silent Unity, Reverend Linda Martella Whitset. It's being offered on a love offering basis and you can sign up at unitychurchofraleigh.com. Mindful Musings is going to take a break for the summer and we'll let you know when they start up again in the fall. Next week is July the 4th and we welcome back Reverend Juan Enrique Toro as our guest speaker. The title of his talk is Our Ultimate Freedom. Now the topic of freedom has been vigorously debated in our society in recent months. But rather than debate the particulars of our national freedom, Reverend Juan suggests that it might be better for us to remember the essence of our freedom as spiritual beings. As we close our service this morning, let us join together in our prayer for protection. And so together, the light of God surrounds us. I am light. The love of God enfolds us. I am love. The power of God protects us. I am power. The presence of God watches over us. I am presence. Wherever we are, God is and all is well. Once again, here's the music team at Unity of the Oaks. And until next time, may God bless you and have a great week. See you then! Just a spoke in the wheel, one grain of sand, but it feels so right to be right where I am. One little part of a much bigger plan, and the longer I'm here, the more I understand.
say.